I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Great. All right. Okay, wonderful. Hi, Amber. Hi, it's so fantastic to meet you. Um, I'm going to be hosting the chat today, if that's okay, um, with you. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Um, we're going to wait a couple more minutes for people to fill you in. Okay. Thank you. Background noise. Yeah, I hear that too. I don't think it's my my microphone. I just muted myself and I still heard it. That sounds better right now. It sounds a little better. I don't I don't hear it now. Okay. So well, let's hope it we... stays that way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, Great. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're still going to give it maybe one more minute just to let more people come into the room if they're not in on time. Um, Ellen, how's your day going while we wait? Oh, it's going well. It's been a, it's been a good day. Yes. Yeah. How about yours, Amber? Good. I'm in uh, sunny San Diego, so can't complain. Um, I like your <laughs> bookshelf behind you though. It's very impressive. I love it. Oh, my books. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, it was a rainy day here in, in Massachusetts for a part of the day, but it cleared enough for me to get my walk in. So that's, oh, good. that's good. <laughs> I know we've been needing some rain. It's just, it gets a little dry, but you know, it's always a nice beach day. So that's okay. I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, that way I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Make sure we start on time um, for the author and for everyone in the audience. So hello, Firesiders. Welcome to Adventures by the Book, where our mission is to connect people and communities through the superpower of books. I'm your host, Amber Reinhart, and I'm delighted today to be hosting fan favorite author Ellen Maripol to chat about her new novel, The Lost Women of Azalea Court. Yes, everyone should be clapping. I just finished the book um, earlier this week and I could not put it down. So I am so excited to act to dive into this today with you, um, talk about all the themes that I picked up on. Just super excited for that. Um, I recommend everyone to get this book. You can go to our website at adventuresbythebook.com to find that um, there. And today's fireside chat is part six and it's the final part of our fall into reading fireside series. Each week we have been chatting with a different author about a different book to help plan your fall reading selections. Um, and if you missed any of our previous fireside chats, you can always go to our YouTube channel. Um, we post all our past recordings on there. Make sure to check that out after and subscribe. And today's approximate 45 minute chat with Ellen is intended as a conversation. So if at any point, anyone in the virtual audience wants to jump on stage, you just go to the little round circle in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Um, you can click jump on stage and then I'll be able to invite you up and you can just chat with me and Ellen. We really wanna hear from you. Um, and if anyone else in the virtual audience, you can broadcast this conversation live on your social media channels by going to that same circle and then clicking the globe icon that will send out um, a link to all of your social media platforms so you can broadcast this chat live. Um, and if again, if you haven't already ordered your copy of The Lost Women of Azalea Court, I highly recommend it. It is perfect for October and spooky season coming up. Um, definitely a perfect gift. And so now without further ado, let's get started with Ellen. Ellen Maripol is the author of the novel, The Lost Women of Azalea Court and guest editor for the anthology, Dreams for a Broken World. Her previous novels are Her Sister's Tattoo, Kinship of Clover, on Hurricane Island and House Arrest. Her work has been honored by the Sartan Women's Prize, the Women's National Book Association, and the Massachusetts Center for the Book. 
So in this new book that we are going to be discussing today, hidden histories haunt both the landscape and the characters. On a chilly November morning, 88-year-old Iris Blum goes missing from Azalea Court, a six bungalow development on the grounds of a long closed state mental hospital. The neighbors of Azalea Court, Lexi, Evelyn, and Detective McPhee narrate the story together, uncovering ghosts, secrets, and lies. Very, very interesting. I cannot wait to dive into it. Um, and we are so delighted to have you here today with us, Ellen, on Fireside. So welcome and congratulations on your new book. Thank you so much, Amber. And I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, of course. And so I'd like to get started by learning a bit about before you were a successful writer. Um, can you talk a little bit about where you grew up and your first exposure to books and if there was anyone who inspired you along the way? I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area and my parents were both readers and I became a reader. And I remember trips to the library as a very young child. Um, I also started writing pretty early, although I didn't really write fiction. I wrote kind of snarky articles um, first just on my own and then for my um, high school newspaper. But my first published piece was actually when I was 12. Um, my parents were really kind of obsessive square dancers and they were out three, four, five nights a week. And so I wrote a piece called, I am a square dance orphan. And I sent it to the National Square Dance Magazine, which published it. And my parents were not thrilled, but <laughs> maybe a little embarrassed, um, but it didn't change their behavior. It did though, tell me that I really loved writing. Oh, I love that. I actually was going, that was going to be my starting point for my next question, because I saw that, um, that title, that title of your article, and it was very interesting. So I had a question about that. But um, with a previous career as a nurse practitioner, can you share a bit about your trajectory through other career fields, and then how that intertwined with writing and if they influenced each other at all? Well, you know, it's an interesting question. So I, I became a registered nurse and then a nurse practitioner, and I worked with children and I loved it. I loved the job, um, but I started making up all these stories in my head about not only about the kinds of situations I met it, in my work, but also some of the kind of ethical dilemmas that I saw played out in a hospital setting. Dilemmas that were sometimes about the medicine, but more often about healthcare in our society and, and what happens when people have resources and what happens when they don't have resources. And so actually my first published novel is really set around an, an ethical dilemma in a medical setting. One time at a reading, somebody asked me if there was any similarity between being a nurse and being a writer. And you know, at the moment, I, I couldn't think of any, you know, I was on the spot and I couldn't think of any, but later, I realized that there really is a similarity that as a nurse, you are kind of honored to be invited into your patients' intimate lives, into the things that really matter to them, um, the things that they want or don't want in their treatment. And that's not all that different than hanging out with your characters and really diving deep into your characters and trying to inhabit them. So in fact, I wasn't aware of it at the time, but I suspect that my career as a nurse um, was really helpful in learning to develop characters. And I feel like when readers read this book, they are going to see exactly what you mean, because I could tell that you had personal experience with a lot of these, these characters were so real. So thank you for putting in all the care that you did for them. Um, and without further ado, let's let's dive into The Lost Women of Azalea Court. Um, if you don't mind me reading, I have a couple questions that go with the book, but I also have passages that I'd like to read 
because they really stood out to me. Um, so first off, Ellen, I have to say I have never read a book quite like this. Um, I could not put it down. Uh, it was so unique. And as I was reading, there were a couple themes and topics that really jumped off the page. And starting off, I want to talk about the setting of the book because it was very interesting on its own. Um, so you chose a decaying state mental hospital as your novel setting, which is truly a fitting place for a mystery novel. Um, and I want to read a passage from the book to give readers an, an idea of what this looks like for them. So um, I'm going to read right here. People often ask us if Azalea Court is cursed. How could it not be, they insist. It's a balloon on a string-shaped road, though that description implies celebration and fun, and that's not really us. Our small home sits on the grounds of the former state mental hospital, where thousands of lost souls were incarcerated over the course of a century and a half. Very creepy. The reader gets a very, really good understanding of what this looks like. Um, and so after finishing the novel, I read in your acknowledgments that you actually lived on the grounds of a former, the former Northampton State Hospital, and you talk about ghosts and the inspiration for the setting. So can you please tell us what was it like to actually live there? And then what was the research process like in regards to that? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting. When I started writing this book, it was set elsewhere. It was set in another city, um, same main characters, um, but a different place. And it really was not working. Um, and then I moved to a condo in a neighborhood that has been built on the grounds of this state hospital. Now, if you drive into this neighborhood, you won't necessarily know that it was once a mental hospital. You know, it now looks like a, a pretty ordinary neighborhood, except it's cluster housing. So things are really close together, surrounded by a lot of woods and fields. Um, but it's, it's, so it doesn't look particularly creepy now, yeah. but the more I learned about the history of the hospital, the more fascinated with it I became. And the bit with the ghosts is now, I'm not sure I really believe in ghosts, you know, <laughs> but I started sort of hearing voices and he getting these very strong feelings that the book should be set in this place. Then, and once I decided to do that, the story totally took off because the setting is a really strong character in yeah. this novel, I think, as, as you've pointed out, the setting is critical. So the research, once I decided to set the novel um, in this place, I had to learn about the hospital. And the research took a totally different process than in any of my other novels. I have always previously written an entire first draft from imagination, and then gone back and done the research in order to fill in the gaps, to try to get things right, um, and to learn what I needed to learn in order to really um, make the story both authentic and to deepen it. Yeah. This time I couldn't even start writing until I knew more. Now, luckily, there's great archival material available and um, 135 years of annual reports are available online and two local organizations have very, very involved archives, both the Public Library and the Public Historic Association. And so I was able to both do the archival research and then interview people. Yeah. Um, because the hospital closed in 1993, I believe, um, there's still plenty of people around town who worked there or who were patients there. Um, and so I was able to spend really a couple of years just immersing myself in what it would have been like to be here when the hospital was functioning. Oh, that is so fascinating. Cause when you're reading this book, you feel like you're really there. And for you to have 
been drawn and have inspiration from that is really, you know, powerful as a reader. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I wanted to dive into the next little topic. So what I particularly loved about this book um, was its setup. And as a reader, you are given a map of Azalea Court and introduced to all the neighbors living there. And then the story unfolds for the reader through, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, 16 different character perspectives, which I have never read anything like this before. And it kept me on my toes, um, including a Greek chorus of women, which was very interesting. So I'm actually going to read a little bit from the book that kind of shows this a little bit more. So there's a quote that says, we did, however, begin to look at each other a little differently, even this early in the game, wondering what that neighbor knew and wasn't saying, or maybe was saying, and would it somehow implicate one of us in Iris's disappearance? What kind of gossip might be being spread? We all hated to be suspicious of our neighbors, but under the circumstances, can you blame us? So as you're reading this book, you know, you're jumping from perspective to perspective, the readers gathering clues, um, they're immersed in the characters and they're questioning the characters along with the detective. Um, so to, for me, this felt like a game of Clue um, mixed with Agatha Christie novels. I loved it. Um, can you tell us why you decided to narrate the book from this many perspectives um, and which character was the hardest to write for? Um, you know, sometimes you don't actually choose uh, the characters kind of say, hey, don't forget me, you got to include me. Um, and I've, all of my novels have multiple narrators, but none of the other ones anywhere near this many narrators. Um, you know, I just kept hearing what each of these neighbors wanted to contribute. And it ended up feeling kind of like an ensemble cast. It ended up feeling to me as a writer that I was telling the story of a community, not just of a missing woman or a couple or a few characters, but this whole little neighborhood became the focus of the story. As to who was the hardest, that has got to be Asher. Um, yeah. Asher Blum, Dr. Blum was the head psychiatrist of the state hospital for the f last 40 years of its existence. And he was the, he was the person who really oversaw the dismantling of the hospital. He was hard to write because he has done some really bad things. And also because he suffered trauma as a child. He was a child in uh, Nazi Europe and he lost a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so, and you know this fairly early in the novel, I'm not really giving anything much away. So for me, it became a question almost of the nature of evil. Um, here was a guy who really did some bad stuff, but could his actions be explained? Could they even be forgiven because of, of the suffering he had in his own life? Um, I think that's one of the kind of questions that I was asking. And it's part of why he was just such a hard, yeah. hard character to really crawl under his skin. Um, the more I did it, the more I could see his humanity. And I, I wanted both his, his, his bad actions and his humanity to, to be part of, of this character. Well, that was, that was the beauty of having him as one of the perspectives, because, you know, we can hear about all the awful things he's done, but then when you get to see what, how he's thinking, you do f realize, oh man, like this guy also went through some stuff. I can understand. So yes, you definitely left the reader to determine what they think is best. Um, speaking of all the different characters, there are so many different characters from all walks of life in this book. We have old couples, young couples, multiracial couples, lesbian couples. Um, but one detail I noticed that you highlighted was gender role expectations. Um, so there are two characters in this book, Eric and Timothy, who are not traditional dads. They're stay at home dads. Um, and Dr. Blum, who we just talked about, actually says at one point, Eric was his only real friend. 
besides Iris. At first, Eric made him nervous. Actually, Asher didn't approve of him. In Asher's world, men went to work and their wives looked after the house and kids. So the reader is presented with this dynamic. And then the reader starts to notice that many of the women in the book, um, like Detective McPhee, Evelyn, Winda, and Lexi, they are badass career women that are out there providing for their families. So I want my question to you is, did you intentionally highlight this theme? And if so, how did you want it to impact the trajectory of the story? Um, yes, I think that in this book, as in my other books as well, I try to create characters that um, may be overlooked in some in some ways of um, in, in some more traditional fiction. Um, the women are really the center of the story, the lost women, um, and the women who live on the court and are trying to figure this out. Um, but the women, the lost women are also the women who lived in the mental hospital, who were committed to the hospital, some of whom had mental illness and some of whom did not. Um, one of the most interesting interviews that I did for this book was with a woman who had been a patient at the hospital for many years. Um, and then it was discovered that in fact, her problem was a, was a physical one, not a mental one. Um, but she called the hospital a convenient place to dump inconvenient people. And the more I read in the archives, Women who were different, who didn't fit in, were often committed to the hospital. Maybe a husband was tired of his wife and he had her committed. Um, many people who were homosexual were committed. Uh, women who were badass and did not conform to what society expected of them. Maybe they didn't want to have kids. Um, as simple as that. Or maybe they did have a child and they had postpartum depression, which was not well um, recognized at that time. So the lost women, I think, became almost my mantra. Who are these people? How can I try to um, invite their voices into this story? Thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and we're actually, I have a couple questions about that topic that we'll touch on in just a few moments. Um, but before we dive into there, there is one more topic when it comes to characters that I want to talk about. And it's, uh, I want to talk about Gloria. Uh, she was one of my favorite characters. And for everyone in the audience, um, Gloria is one of the main characters who is a homeless woman. Um, and she has this fierce cat named Canary, who's just adorable. Um, and you can't help but love her. Uh, so while many of the characters in this book struggled, Gloria struggled in a different way. Um, at one point during the story, Gloria is scared to be seen in public uh, with someone solely because she is homeless. So having that homeless element definitely adds to the story in a way that the other characters can't add to. So can you talk about why you included Gloria's character in this narrative and how the homeless have been stigmatized by mental illness um, quite often? Yes. Well, at one point in the history of this hospital, uh, the Northampton State Hospital, um, the courts decided that the hospital was not meeting the needs of the patients and that, in fact, inpatient psychiatric care in general was on its way um, out, in, at least in terms of, of public hospitals like this. Um, and many of the people who um, were kind of turned out of the hospital ended up being homeless because there were not good placements for them. There weren't enough halfway houses or um, sort of supervised uh, home situations. And so um, homelessness was kind of a byproduct of the closing of the hospital. And it felt because of that, that um, Gloria might have a role. But to tell you the honest truth, she just, she won me over. 
So once she, once she um, popped up in the story, um, I had no choice but to say, yeah, come on in and tell us your, your part of this. And she plays an important role, which I won't give away. <laughs> She just has such a big heart. And even as a reader, you're you're a little bit, you know, you don't want, you don't know if you trust her. But then, you know, after you meet her, after that first perspective with her, she's, you know, one of the best characters for sure. So thank you for talking about a little bit about Gloria. I want to go back to talking about trauma. Uh, we touched on it a bit, but this was by far probably the heaviest theme of the book. Um, and almost every character is dealing with it in some kind of way. So for me, the themes of ghosts and trauma intertwined, um, sometimes quite literally. And Ellen, you skillfully delve um, into the world of trauma, how trauma begets trauma, even when decades of shame and silence have passed. Um, and then you also mes mention ghosts with several other characters. So as a reader, these two themes come together and you can't help but think that um, trauma can haunt us too. So in the book, uh, the women of Azalea Court are left to confront their own unique traumas that have been haunting them. One character is the victim of sexual assault. Another is a Holocaust survivor. Another has been held prisoner um, in a civilian detention center. Can you talk about your motivation to highlight these very different types of trauma, but also how you chose to discuss these topics in a very respectful and meaningful way? Well, thank you. Um, you know, it's it's kind of tricky to try to weave um, to weave these kinds of trauma into a novel. And in one situation, um, the character just came with all of it. Um, Gandalf um, mm -hmm. was the main character in my second novel, mm -hmm. and she insisted on coming back. And so she carried with her all the things that had happened to her uh, in the novel on Hurricane Island. Um, in term, and, and as I said before, Asher's background, Dr. Blum's background, is an integral part of why he felt so, it was so necessary to try to protect himself and his family in the ways that he chose to do. Um, I think his trauma in many ways explain um, his decisions, although he certainly had a choice about doing the things he did or not. Um, the other character you mentioned who was assaulted, um, I'll share with you that when I was a nursing student, I did my psychiatric um, training at this hospital. I was young and I had, I was assaulted in a very different way than the character. Um, and, you know, so I did what writers do. We take our own trauma and we give it to a character. We change it, we transform it to meet the needs of a story. Um, but that came directly from my own experience many decades ago, you know, an experience which I had kind of put aside, but writing it in Evelyn's character meant that I could bring it out and look at it and think about it and try to understand it in a different way so that it made sense for the character and it made sense for the story. Um, does that does that kind of answer your your question, Amber? Am I absolutely absolutely? I I've heard many times from authors that like making sense of the horrible things that go on. They have to they have to get that out somehow, and writing is a very great way to do so. Um, and it lets us talk about things that I don't think we'd be able to talk about otherwise. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that, and I'm I'm very sorry for what happened to you. Um, no one deserves to be treated that way. So thank you for sharing and being so vulnerable. Um, staying in around this same topic, um, you use these different perspectives and the Greek chorus of the lost women um, to highlight our, cult our, cult uh, our culture's shameful history at handling mental illness um, in public institutions. Um, and one of, the, one of the main characters, Asher Blum, who we've talked about, 
He's drafting a manuscript titled What We Thought We Knew About the Treatment of Mental Illness. Um, and it's very insightful to read kind of his thought process as the book progresses. Um, but I wanted to read a quote from the book that best depicts this theme because I think it's so important um, to talk about. I know we've talked about it a little bit before, but um, I'm just going to go ahead and read. In the bad old days, one physician... Any kind of doctor could commit a person to the hospital. A court hearing was supposed to follow, but judges rarely questioned the doctor's assessment. That's horrible, Gloria said. Shameful, Roberta agreed. In the late 60s, they rewrote the laws, but before then, a lot of people ended up at the hospital who didn't belong there. So you talked a little bit about this before, Ellen, but as a reader, I was unaware at the severity of the situation back then. So it was very eye-opening to learned so much about this um, and all of the horrible things that happened. So can you talk a little bit about why you made this the focal point of your novel? Um, and is there anything you want to say to readers about what you learned from this history of mental illness? Yeah, thank you. That I, I do want to talk about that, Amber. You know, in doing the research, both the archival research and in interviewing um, people who were psychiatrists or nurses or attendants, um, social workers at the hospital, what I really learned was contradictory. On the one hand, these state hospitals, public mental hospitals, were started with the loftiest of ideals, the noblest of ideals. Previously, people who were mentally ill and particularly people who were poor and mentally ill ended up in jails. There was no place for them. Um, and so, you know, Massachusetts started um, these public hospitals with a real hope of both taking care of and hopefully curing people. Um, they called it moral treatment. And mm -hmm. one of the, one of the um, aspects of this was the hospital was built in this gorgeous place on top of a hill. Mm -hmm. um, it's the best sledding hill in town um, still. And it's a really beautiful setting. And there are hundreds of acres around it. And those acres were farmed. And the belief was that if you took people away from whatever the circumstances were that were making them ill and you put them in a beautiful place and you gave them meaningful work to do um, and the the patients farmed the land and they did all of the work you know in the gardens and um the belief was that they would get better hmm. um i think it failed for three reasons one was underfunding there simply wasn't enough money put in. The second was overcrowding. Um, the hospital ended up housing many times the number of patients it was supposed to be able to hold. And the third was very simply the lack of understanding about what causes mental illness and how to treat it. Um, you know, so in the 50s, which is sort of an important time in the chronology of the backstory of the novel, yeah. it, that's when the psych meds um, first started being used. And so at that point, patients were often heavily sedated. Um, the treatments we now look at as kind of barbaric, but it was the best they knew at that time. And so I ended up feeling two things. On the one hand, feeling grateful that people cared enough to try to really do this. And on the other hand, deeply disappointing, disappointed that we, we failed these individuals so, so badly. Yeah, and th those are the people in the book that they are ghosts. They do haunt you. They, it might not be the traditional way, but I'm still left thinking about some of the characters and what what their endings were and how if this was 100 years ago, I could have had the same ending, you know? So thank you for talking about a bit about that. I think it's important to talk about, to remember them, and to make sure that that never happens again. Um, and with moving on with the same topic almost, um, 
the oppression of women, especially regarding mental illness, um, was at the forefront of this novel. The title of this book was The Lost Women of Azalea Court. They are the stars of this book. Um, I want to read a quote that really shows the voice of these women and where they were at. So she was most curious about the women incarcerated there, here. She thought of them as the lost women, the ones whose husbands tired of them, who didn't fit the norms of their time. Women like her, who didn't want to be wives and mothers. She thought of her interest as the flip side of her father's research for his book. Maybe one day she'd write her own book to bring those lost women back to life. And I feel like that's exactly what you did. Um, you did that. And so as a reader, when you get towards the end of the book, there's this very powerful scene where all of the women's stories, you find that they kind of intersect. And no matter where they came from, they all still support each other and understand each other and back each other up. So my question to you is, why do you think it is important as women that we support one another, um, even when we come from different walks of life? Um, well, that's sort of an interesting question. I, I ended up feeling that even though this book centers on this elderly couple, Iris and Asher, it is really the story of this group of women who, in the context of their loss and grief, really do come together. Um, there are men who also support them. Um, there are a few men in the book who really um, do their best um, to support the women and girls in their in their lives, but it really is a book about women and about the ways in which we can understand each other. As you say, there are some people who really don't fit in to Azalea Court, but are still welcomed, at least to the extent that that they're willing to be welcomed. Um, and the more I wrote it, the more fondness I felt for all of these, all of these characters. Um, I was sort of unhappy to, to reach the end of the story because I really wanted to hang out with them um, and to kind of be part of their neighborhood. I felt like it was a sisterhood when I had finished reading. Um, mm -hmm. It was very, yeah, I didn't want it to end either, but I was also happy for them. I was happy for how their their story, you know, stayed. Um, I just want to remind the audience, we've still got some time with Ellen, but if at any point you want to jump on stage and ask her a question or just say hi, please feel free to do so. We've still got 10, 15 more minutes. So, you know, don't be afraid to jump on stage. We really want to hear from you. Um, but I'll continue on with my questions uh, until anyone else wants to jump on. Um, so we're talking about the end, where the reader is left off. Um, I at no least spoilers. felt... No spoilers. <laughs> no spoilers. But I at least felt with all the themes that we've talked about today, well, where does that leave us now? What do we do now? Especially with how the last two years went with the pandemic. I think this book is very relatable in that way. Um, and so I'm going to read one more last quote of where I think you kind of answer that for us on what we should do. Um, our selfishness accused us, shamed us. We resolved to be better in the future, be better friends, stronger allies for each other. And I really think that's everything. I think making, making sure you take care of your neighbor and take, making a connection with someone. I think that's really important. That was the main takeaway I got when I finished, but I wanted to ask you, what is the overall message you hope readers walk away from with this book? Hmm. You know, that's an interesting question. I never really think about theme when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. I write the characters, um, I, I put them in trouble and then I watch them try to get out of trouble. Um, and I try not to think too much about theme because it's really easy if you think about theme to get a little didactic and to tell people what to think. And I think readers are smart and readers can take a story and take from it 
what is the overriding theme for them. Yeah. Um, what, what I end up feeling when I think about the book, though, um, is also something about community and the importance of community. Um, you know, we're living in a really broken time in our world and um, people, especially people who don't agree with each other, um, are pretty nasty. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I have strong feelings like probably all of you have strong feelings, um, but there needs to be some way to to find communities that work for us and to nurture those communities. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. I, I don't like to tell readers what to think because I, I think that. readers can do that on, on their yep, own. They'll get what they get. Yeah. I, I mean, that's what I got from it. And, and I love that you didn't answer everything. You let us think for ourselves. So I appreciate that answer. Um, now, a little bit off the book, let's talk about your fans, your readers. Um, so I like to think that, you know, most relationships are two ways, you know, you give and you take. So as an author, what have you learned about the writing craft that your readers have taught you? Hmm. Well, readers have asked questions that made me see things in my books that I did not, that I never hmm. saw. The one I mentioned earlier about what was the relationship between nursing and writing. Yeah. I never would have, I never would have made that connection had a reader not asked me that question. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that readers have, um, have often asked me to, to make connections in my own work that I might not have seen. You know, there are different ways of, of writing a novel and some people, including some of my writer friends, um, outline and they know where they're going and they know who their characters are and they, and then they, they write the book. Um, Kurt Vonnegut once said, um, the way to write a novel is to jump off a cliff and develop <laughs> wings on the way down. And I consider myself a very happy member of the Kurt Vonnegut School of writing a novel because I start with this little what if and, and then I cartwheel all the way down trying to spin a tail uh, from it. And so often I don't, I, I'm not a cerebral writer, I guess is what I think. I'm, I'm trying to say. And so often I don't see those connections until um, a reader says, well, did you really mean for this and this to be a metaphor for this? I was like, <laughs> well, yeah. So, so writers have, uh, readers have really been fantastic in helping me understand what it is I'm talking about. No, I love that. I'm, I hope everyone listening is taking this in right now because you can help us out. It looks like Debbie wants to jump on stage. I'm going to accept that. Let's see here. Debbie, go ahead. Hello, Amber. Hello, Ellen. Hello, Susan. It's good to be here and to be hearing about your story. This is just really interesting to me. I Just as the readers are, are teaching you things, obviously authors are teaching me things, I thought it was... Um, it was really interesting, your comment, setting as a strong character. I love that. I never really thought of it that way, but that is such a key role in a book. But to think of that, that as a character, I mean, that was really powerful to me. So so thank you for that. I wrote it down. So, so interesting to me, and, and I've heard conversations with you previously, so I know about a uh, little bit about your, your personal history, but I thought it was interesting early on that you kind of framed the time of the story by, and, and I'll read it to you. Lexi's parents had moved to Azalea Court in August 1953, two months after the Rosenbergs were executed. Her mother told her that many times, always in a whisper as if the FBI was listening in. So why did you feel it was necessary to put that that descriptor in or that, that um, piece of history in? 
Well, that, that's a that's a really interesting um, question, Debbie. Um, partly, it's an insider thing. Um, I have to admit. So I'm married to the younger son of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, who were executed in 1953 for conspiracy to commit espionage. So the Rosenberg case has been a very big part of my life, my whole adult life. I met Robbie when I was 19. Um, so I partly it's that it's such a part of me that it often comes into books. But there was also a more kind of reasonable <laughs> reason. And that is that it set the tone for Asher. Asher, many of Asher's actions came because of anti-Semitism, which he felt his whole life and which was a really big part of who he became, of, of how he developed. Um, and because he came of age in the 1950s during the McCarthy period. And so some of the decisions he made that ended up leading to some of the worst things he did were to try to protect his family when he felt threatened by the possibility of being called red. And so there really were reasons in terms of developing Asher's character, why that would be something that was part of the family that Lexi grew up in. The, you know, Lexi is the daughter, the middle-aged daughter of Asher and Iris, and is a, an important part of the, of the uh, story. So does that make sense to you, Debbie, in terms of sort of creating that as part of his own background, his own makeup? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Thank you. And and I knew the piece about your personal history with it because I'd heard an interview with you previously. And I thought that was fascinating because that was right at the front of the book. So I, I was just curious about that. One other really quick thing, if, if I have time, if I may. So I'm, I'm about nine tenths of the way through the book. I was hoping to get it done today and, and then work got in the way, <laughs> but I'm getting there. So no spoilers. But so I just thought this was really beautiful and it touched me. I, I'm, I'm reading in the book. Um, Eric is talking to Asher and, and Eric says, um, you're a Holocaust survivor, right? And Asher says, yes, as a teenager, a child. And maybe that explains what you did because of what you lived through. Your fears about bad things happening to your family again? No, Asher sighed deeply. You don't understand. That's why I should have known better, acted better. To, I, I won't pronounce this right. Tikkun Olam? Mm-hmm. What's that? It's Hebrew, means to repair the world. That's what Jews are supposed to do, not make it worse. I, I hadn't heard that. I'm not Jewish personally, but I think that's just beautiful. And I think that applies to all of us. But is that something that you, or how did that, talk about that if you could. I don't know quite what the question is with that, but. Yeah, I mean, there is a, Judaism um, does tell people to repair the world. It's part of our job. And, you know, Asher understands that and, and his understanding of the fact that the way he acted um, was not in accordance with his beliefs is part of what made writing him as a character just so, so both difficult and oddly satisfying because he does understand that even though we didn't live it. I guess we all have that in common, what, we're, what we should be doing and, and, and what, what we, we do, but that's, that's a beautiful concept. So thank you for that. And thank you for your time. It's really interesting. And Amber, you're asking great questions. So I'm really appreciating it. Thank, thank you. you for coming back for more, Debbie. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Debbie. And anyone else, this is your last chance to jump up on stage. I only have a couple questions left, and then we have to say goodbye to Ellen. So this is your last chance. Uh, we really want to hear from you. Uh, but in the meantime, I always ask writers this question, Ellen, just because I want to know, um, what advice do you have for your younger writer self, um, for any aspiring writers out there? Well, it's different. My younger writer self, I would say, hey, start writing sooner. 
<laughs> you waited too long because <laughs> I didn't start writing fiction until I was in my 50s. So okay. um, I think to, to other writers of any age, um, you know, the main thing I would, I would say two things. One is you don't have to do it alone. Um, my writing life has been incredibly enriched by being in a manuscript group with other writers. We share mm -hmm. our work. We both support each other and criticize each other's work. Um, we try to be as nurturing and as honest as we can be. And honestly, I can't imagine doing this on my own. Um, these writer friends are really critical to my, to my work. The second thing is to just trust your own, your own voice and to try to develop it. Um, a writer friend of mine once said that her agent told her that she'd better put a vampire in her book because then it would sell. And, you know, but we can't do that. We have to write the stories that really move us, that, that grab us, that we can't let go of, that we've got to follow to the end, um, rather than looking for what's going to sell. Well, that's great advice. I wrote down what you said, because I've never had anyone say that before. Don't do it alone. Most of the time, I think writers feel self-conscious or scared to share what they're creating. So I love that advice. It takes a lot of bravery to do that, I think. Um, what's next on the horizon for you? Anything that you can share with us on what you're working on, if you can share, or? I'm, I'm sort of working on a series of linked short stories. Oh. Um, but I have a really bad history of starting short stories and it ends up as a novel. So I don't know. <laughs> I love that. I don't know. More novels in the work. Okay. Yeah, um, I don't know. And where can fans reach you? Do you have um, social media that you like to share or any other platforms? Yeah. I have a website, just www.ellenmirapol.com. Very easy. I'm on Facebook and Instagram and occasionally Twitter, although it drives me crazy. Um, but um, yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm doing a, a lot of events now for this book. So I'm around mostly in the Northeast because that's where I live and I'm trying not to get on an airplane. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And it looks like um, Diane just jumped on stage. So Diane, do you have a question? or comment um, and you might be muted you might have to go mm, let me see let me see if I can help you out you have to go uh, to that to the little circle in the bottom and then you can unmute yourself right now you have um, like a slash through your microphone can you find that are you able to find that let's see Okay, well, while Diane figures that out, um, let's give her one more second to see if she can figure that out. Yeah, Diane, there's a button um, right at the bottom of your screen next to the React button. And you just click on that. Oh, it looks like you unmuted yourself. There you go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Oh, thank you so much for my um, for patience with me figuring out this new system. Um, <laughs> I, I just ordered my book, Ellen. This sounds fascinating. And I'm also a registered nurse, um, wow. so I'm happy to support another nurse. But um, so just a comment, because I haven't read the book like everyone else. And this has been a fantastic conversation, Amber. Thank you. Um, I know sometimes as a nurse, I, oh, thank you. I am um, sort of dismayed at how much history we keep finding out about um, the way people were treated in the past. And um, so this just sounds fascinating. So thank you very much. I look forward to reading it. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on stage, Diane. We love all the input. Um, and without further ado, I think that's it for our questions. So Thank you everyone for coming today and joining us. Um, it's been so much fun chatting with you, Ellen. I, I loved picking your brain, especially after really 
you know, diving into this book. It was so fantastic to do so. And again, for everyone out there in the audience, if you haven't done so, please go to the center of your screen um, at the fortune cookie button and get your copy right now. It is perfect for spooky season for October. We have Christmas coming up, holidays coming up. This is the book to get. Um, go ahead and support Ellen and do so. And if you want to hear more from me or Ellen on Fireside, uh, you can click on our icons and then follow us. And anytime we're on Fireside, you'll get a notification. And if you aren't familiar with Adventures by the Book, um, check out our website. Again, it's in the center of the screen or you can go to adventuresbythebook.com. Um, we do in-person events, Zoom events, travel events. We're really excited for our writer's retreat um, in Eastern Sierras. It's gonna be a nature's lover adventure and that's coming up in early October. There are two seats left, so get your ticket today. Um, and we're gonna take a little bit of a break from Fireside, but we have another series possibly in the works, so we'll stay tuned for that. Um, and thank you again, Ellen, for everything, for your work, your research, and your kind words today. It was truly a fantastic chat. Um, and until next time, what is your next adventure by the book? Have a fantastic day, everyone. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, everybody. Okay.